Hello, I'm Peter Clift, and I would like to welcome you to the June edition of the U3A Radio podcast, bringing you the voices and the stories that matter to you. As usual, we have an exciting lineup for you this month. We're diving into the world of pirate radio in the swinging 60s with a special guest who was right there. Get ready for some nostalgia and fascinating stories from an era that changed music forever when one of our very own U3A members will share their incredible experiences for those rebellious days of pirate radio at sea. Uh, It could get very rough. That was the only bad times that I knew of. It became so bad at one stage, I remember, on the North Ship that the captain called us out of our cabins at two o'clock in the morning and asked us to put life jackets on. It was that bad. And that's not all. We'll be chatting to one of our own podcast presenters, who is both a songwriter and a talented musician. Someone born in the sort of you know, late 50s in um, you know, relative prosperity of, of South East London has a fascination with the music that was born out of sort of deprivation and poverty of the southern states of, um, of America. We have all, at some time, had problems with our eyes or our teeth. Our intrepid reporter Bob Wells is fascinated to know why, and he chatted with Professor Alex Bezerides about these common problems. Most of us suffer at some point from some sort of body condition that causes an issue of sorts. For example, you may have to wear glasses or contacts, you may have had a bad back, or you may have work done on your teeth to straighten them. Have you ever wondered why? Well, here to answer some of those questions, I'm delighted to be joined by Alex Bezeridas. Alex is a professor of biology at Lewis Clark State College in Idaho. He recently brought out his first book called Evolution Gone Wrong, The Curious Reasons Why Our Bodies Work or Don't. Hello and welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So I mentioned yeah. earlier on, you know, a lot of us have problems with teeth. Yeah, that one all drives to the relationship between the jaw and the teeth. And for that one, you you do have to get back into the water and look at the first examples of teeth and animals. And the crazy thing here is the first teeth and animals, they're not not in the mouth. There are these hard structures on some of the earliest fish that cover their their skin, call them denticles. And And so then some other fish have teeth down in their throats. They're all the way down here. And eventually, those teeth make their way up to the jaw, or at least up to the oral cavity. Um, and some of them don't even have a jaw. I always, whenever I give talks, I, I carry a lamprey around. A lamprey is this eel-like fish. There's actually still a fair amount of them around here, so the people locally in Idaho know this fish. And they're this crazy-looking fish with this mouth that they have oral teeth, but they have no jaw. They just suck onto things. They suck onto the sides of other fishes and make a living as a parasite. And the the point I like to stress there is that the teeth and the jaw are independent structures. Yeah. So as our jaws um, got smaller, the teeth were almost sort of having to play catch up. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and they are, you know, they're they're shrinking over time. If you look at the size of teeth over the last hundred thousand years, they're shrinking quite a bit. But now, you know, and it's not a bad thing that we've are sort of curbing natural selection in this way. I mean, I like being able to go and get my teeth straightened and fixed and make them work a little better. But but it does impact the way that evolution is going to work on this issue, right? We all go to the, you know, a lot of people end up getting these issues. These days, you can have grossly mismatched jaw and teeth, get it all cleaned up, go on a date, meet a girl, have three kids that you pass on, your t- tooth jaw mismatched too, you know? So could you just explain to for listeners why we have these issues with the eye as well? The eye is a fascinating one. You have to you have to go back in the water again and, and recognize that the vertebrate eye evolved in the water, which means the vertebrate eye evolved to be wet. Um, that right there drives some pretty interesting anatomy about our eye. It's why we have to we have to keep it wet. It evolved to be wet. It has to stay wet. It's, so we make a, a quite a volume of tears every day. You're making about that 300 milliliters or so a day of tears every day you make that many tears um just to keep your eyes wet you have to blink a gazillion times every day to get them dragged across your eye to keep it wet Um, no it's wild all these things just because because the eye evolved wet and if it doesn't stay wet it's a huge problem um but the eye the eye is an interesting one because the eye's been out of the water for so long now that 
it's become supremely adapted to life on land. And we have these structures, the cornea and the lens that, that can refract the light and bend it to help it land on the retina at the back of the eye. And it works, it works pretty darn well. Um, it's just, if during those early, during those early developmental years, if the eye doesn't develop to the right length, which seems to be coming, it's becoming more and more common, um, then the light lands right before the retina and that's nearsightedness or it lands behind the retina and that's farsightedness. And people are trying to figure out why this is becoming more of a problem in the modern age because the myopia rates are just skyrocketing. You go, you know, 20 years ago, maybe 20% of the world was myopic. And now it's, you know, one generation later, it's up to a third of the world has myopia. And it's looking like, and by 2050, they're saying it's going to be about half the world's population will have myopia. And the leading hypothesis for what's going on here, and there's now some pretty good evidence to support it, is that it has to do with all the time we're spending inside. And the light, the, the eye is not getting its sort of natural development that it has always had spending time outside. Whether or not, whether or not that's, that's having the amount of light coming in, whether or not it's focusing on things that aren't so close and being, you know, focusing on the horizon and on the distance, exactly why it's happening, you know, exactly the mechanism, mechanism I don't think is understood. But there's mounting evidence that, that we need to kick our kids out of the basement and outside if you want to give their eye a chance to develop to the right length. I'm a good anecdotal example of this. I, I, I was pretty lucky with my eyes. Spent a ton of time outside as a kid. Didn't have... And my distance vision is still spectacular. I mean, but but now the older you get, there are going to be some things you cannot avoid. Eventually, those those muscles get yeah. a little tired of bending your lens your whole life, and you're stuck with these. But but not the eyes. Yeah. The eye is one where I think more of the blame is actually in the modern lifestyle than in the past. We have some quirks due to the past, but I I actually think more of the blame with the eye is it's a unique one for that in that sense. In the book, most of the book is about blaming the past. <laughs> My guest today has been Alex Bezaridis. Alex is author of the book Evolution Gone Wrong, The Curious Reasons Why Our Bodies Work or Don't. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Bob Wells there talking to Professor Alex Bezaridis. So the next time you go to the dentist or the opticians, remember to blame any problems on evolution and our ancestors in prehistory. It's time to forget about our ailments and go back to simpler times to the swinging 60s. Mini skirts, long hair, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, all that music. And where do we listen to that music? Oh, many of us listen to the pirate radio stations with those tiny transistor radios. Remember those? Well, believe it or not, it was 60 years ago this year that it all started with the first pirate radio station, Radio Caroline. Somebody who joined Caroline in 1967 and who started our early U3A podcasts was Nick Bailey. I have invited Nick back to U3A to chat about his time on board Caroline and his early broadcasting career. Hi, Nick. Welcome back. Hi, Peter. Nice to be back, uh, albeit in a different role. We are missing you on uh, U3A radio, I must say. Well, it was something I really enjoyed, but um, because I now work for Boom Radio, it just got a little bit too much. Now, I'd like to, if I may, just take you take you way back to the, the swinging 60s. You started off, indeed, on Radio Caroline. I did, yes. I was 19 years old. Uh, this was in September 66, and I joined uh, Radio Caroline uh, South uh, as a newsreader. And uh, I was there only for a month before I was transferred to the North Ship. Now, let me explain. The South Ship was three miles off the coast of Felixstowe, and the North Ship was three miles off the coast of Ramsey uh, in the Isle of Man. Uh, what had happened when Caroline started in 64, and this is the 60th anniversary year, it became so successful very quickly that they wanted to cover as much of the country as possible. Uh, Caroline South off the coast of Felixstowe covered London and maybe as far up to Birmingham and uh, also Northern Europe. But it didn't cover a lot of the UK. So what they did, the original ship set sail. No one knew where it was going to lay anchor, but eventually it did lay anchor uh, off the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man was a perfect place, actually, because uh, radio transmissions bounce across water so much better than across land. And funny enough, the Isle of Man has its own par parliament called Tinwald, and they have a, a, a sort of national day, Tinwald Day, and, and ended up 
uh, off the coast of Ramsey on Tynwald Day, which was um, particularly appropriate. And that's where they stayed uh, until eventually it all came to a, a sticky end in uh, 1968 when both ships uh, towed away. Whereas the South ship was exciting, of course, because uh, one was broadcasting to uh, millions of people. I actually preferred the North ship because the North ship was much bigger. Uh, on the South ship, I had to share a cabin with several others. On the North ship, I had my own cabin. The mess room was enormous, actually, on the North ship. We had our own, uh, own table tennis table. And I think we ate a lot better because both ships had a Dutch crew. But they, I remember the dining room on the South ship was very, very small. Uh, on the North ship, we had um, plenty of room to relax and expand and expound <laughs> on all the things we were talking about at the time. But um, because we were in the Isle of Man, we had Manx kippers for breakfast every day. We cooked our own bread. There were bread ovens all around the deck. And we had our own chickens. So I don't think we ate the chickens, but certainly we had um, uh, fresh uh, eggs. It was just a very, very, very exciting time. Well, it sounds... Almost luxurious, but there must have been some bad times on, on board ship, surely. Uh, it could get very rough. That was the only bad times that I knew of. It became so bad at one stage, I remember, on the North ship that the captain pulled us out of our cabins at two o'clock in the morning and asked us to put life jackets on. It was that bad. Luckily, the storm passed and we didn't have to abandon ship. Luckily, I wasn't um, seasick because I, I could be reading the news and I'd see sea one moment and sky the next. And I quite like rough weather. Uh, conversely, we would swim off the side of the ship. I did that on the South Ship, and I particularly remember that off the Isle of Man, where the sea would be like a mill pond. Um, and Tony Prince, who was one of my colleagues, would dive from the top deck. That would be his party trick. But we'd go swimming off the side. We'd go, we'd take the lifeboat out and go fishing. It was luxurious, really, because I was working at the Mermaid Theatre in London and uh, it tripled my wage. You've got to remember this was 66 and I was getting on Caroline £25 a week tax free. And we had and it was all found. Um, and we used to work two weeks on one week off. So I came off the ship with um, £75. And it's the richest I've ever felt, to be honest. And we had our own beer ration, cigarette ration, soft drinks ration. They even did our dry cleaning. As a 19-year-old, obviously having a good time, did you ever think that the pirates would have such a huge effect on British broadcasting that they did? I was conscious that history was in the making. And to that end, I had a Kodak Instamatic uh, and I took lots and lots of photographs because I knew that this was this was history and it wasn't going to be repeated. I also borrowed a cine camera from my uh, mother to uh, took quite a, a few shots around the ship. I, I got a shot of Tony Prince diving into the water, for instance, and I put the two together oh, about 10 years ago and uh, did some commentary on it. And I've used that when I've been uh, doing presentations, um, particularly with uh, P&O when I did uh, music cruises for them. I think it was it was constantly in the news. I think the fact that we knew it was potentially going to come to an end, uh, that exercised the public's mind. And we were known as pirates. And because we were at sea, it just became very exciting. I mean, I think that if we'd been, uh, been allowed to come ashore, which was what we were pushing for and become legal, I think all the glamour would have gone because we'd have become establishment. We weren't at sea anymore. Um, that didn't happen. And as you probably know, uh, when uh, the 14th of August came, which was the date of the Marine Broadcasting Offences Act, uh, Caroline continued very bravely, but it didn't work out. So having been forced to uh, to close and to give up your job, you, you went to Australia, you went on to, to Hong Kong, and I know you, you've got very fond memories of Hong Kong, haven't you? Uh, I have. Uh, I mean, I went to Australia because I knew I wouldn't get a job in the UK. And the person who employed me uh, was uh, Australian. So uh, and I spent my childhood in Australia. So I had five years working there in, in radio, but eventually ending up in Brisbane presenting a late night program. I have uh, particular memories of Hong Kong, as you say. I first went there on the way back from Australia. And I just popped in and um, I, I got a job. I think they were, they were used to employing transient people. It was whilst I was there that I first became aware of the British Forces Broadcasting Service because they used to use their programs. And I thought, this is a nice outfit. I love travel. Uh, so when I got back to the UK, I applied to BFBS, as they're known. 
and eventually got in and I was sent to Gibraltar and Cologne and Berlin. I was also sent to Hong Kong to set up their English language station. They already had a Nepalese station. That was my second uh, experience with the Hong Kong. My first child was born there. And then I was posted back to the UK on promotion, didn't like it at all. And so went back to Hong Kong working for the government station that I'd already worked for for a few months in 1972 and stayed there for seven years where two further children were born. By that time, I'd moved into current affairs um, and I did a current affairs show for uh, five years, which was very exciting because of the handover to China of Hong Kong. Uh, but eventually, I I think I got cold feet because I thought come 97, freedom of speech uh, could be ended. As it so happened, freedom of speech in Hong Kong lasted until about 2013, even slightly longer. I mean, it's not the case anymore. But I, I think also uh, I was worried about my age because um, in 92, which is when I left, um, I was getting on for 45. And I thought if I stay till 97, I'll be 50. Um, and if it all goes belly up, it's going to be very difficult to get a job. So great times then in, in Hong Kong and, and Australia. Just before you go, could we just take you way back to the mid-1960s and you reading the news on Radio Caroline? Good morning, this is Nick Bailey with the 8 o'clock news bulletin, the Isle of Man. Support continues to pour in from all over the world for the Isle of Man and their fight for freedom. Member nations of the Committee for Colonialism at the United Nations have pledged their support for the island, and unconfirmed reports from New York quote Senator Goldberg, the U.S. representative at the U.N., as saying that he will support the island's case. Today, the Court of Tinwald will be meeting in the historical Parliament building in Douglas to consider a resolution calling for complete autonomy in the island's domestic affairs and censuring the Labour government in Westminster for their action in attempting to apply the oppressive Marine Offences Bill to the Isle of Man against the wishes of the people. And now the rest of the news. America, the United States Commission on Civil Rights has proposed stronger laws to end white-only schools. In, the in case you've just tuned in, that was actually Nick Bailey reading the news on Radio Caroline way back in the 1960s. Nick, great to talk to you as ever. Thanks very much indeed. Peter, it's, a, it's been a pleasure. And you can read more about Nick's time on Radio Caroline in the latest edition of View 3A Matters. And you can also purchase Nick's book called Across the Waves, from Radio Caroline to Classic FM, which is available from nickbaileyradio.com. That's nickbaileyradio, or one word, dot com. And there you'll find lots of photos of Radio Caroline and other nostalgic bits. Now, Nick has promised to return later this year to tell us more about his time on Classic FM and Boom Radio. Remaining with the talent within you, 3A... Many of our reporters have their own areas of expertise, and Lee Wellbrook is also a U3A music subject advisor. A talented musician himself, Lee has been telling Joanne Watson about how his love of music began. My older sister had a guitar for many years, which had been sitting around the house being unplayed, and about the age of 14 or 15, I was getting more in interested in how music worked, how sounds were made, how records sounded the way they did. And I, I kind of picked up the guitar and started wanting to play it, wanting to make sounds out of it. I also realised that having a guitar and being in a group was something that, you know, in my mind, made you attractive to people of the opposite sex. So there was a there was that incentive as well. I'd always been interested in listening to music and to the point where I, I was very interested in, say, the mechanics of it. Who wrote the songs? Who played guitar on this bit? Why does this sound like it does? And that's been with me most of my life. Now, you played in a small band in, in small gigs, which I think was pretty common in the period you were growing up, and including one that had, dare I say, more illustrious bands on the bill. Uh, yes, this, this would have been in the uh, sort of mid to late 70s. We did that for a short period of time, have a, a record contract with RSO Records. So we were stable mates with the likes of the Bee Gees and Eric Clapton, but ne never got to those heights. I think we had a, a couple of singles released by them. But one of the things we did uh, where I lived in South East London, there was a, a small community of students or whatever living in these council flats. And they used to put on a music festival each year. And we were about fourth or fifth on the bill two other bands above us one of them was squeeze 
who were local bands to us anyway, and we knew them. Uh, but the other one was a band who, up until that time, had been known as Cafe Racers, and this was their first outing under their new name of Dire Straits. So all of those went on to better things. I'm not sure that I did. <laughs> now, you are the U3A advisor for certain music topics, the blues, Motown, the art of album cover. And then you've got one in the works, I know, take 10 songs. But what's your fascination with the blues? Because that's not really the era you grew up in. No, it isn't. And it sometimes feels a little inauthentic that um, as a someone born in the sort of you know, late 50s in um, you know, relative prosperity of, of South East London has a fascination with the music that was born out of sort of deprivation and poverty of the southern states of, um, of America. But my older sister, again, one of her boyfriends was a big music fan, and he introduced me at a very early age to the music of the likes of Bessie Smith, and various other very early blues artists. And there was just something about the music that kind of connected with me. All of blues is is very much personal experience, partly because of the sort of, you know, the sort of suffering and deprivation that goes into the songs. But also there's an awful lot of blues songs that are very funny and quite joyous. I also have a similar connection to uh, another sort of branch of American music, which is the sort of the Americana music, which is the, you know, the, the music that started off as in the Appalachians, the sort of mountain music, which is effectively the white American version of folk music, which goes alongside the black American uh, version of folk music. There is also a big crossover between those two types of music, which hasn't been recognized as much as it it should be but both of those kinds of music really there's something in there that resonates with me probably the the telling of personal experiences now one subject that you're working on is called take 10 songs uh, yeah this is something i've had on the back burner for quite a time and i'm hoping to get completed sometime soon and run as a course it goes back to my fascination with the mechanics of music. It's basically why pop songs work. And I was going to look at 10 songs from over a period of sort of 25 years or so and look at some of the key things that make that song work. And they will be things like, is it the performance? Is it the arrangement? Is it the production? Is it the structure of the song? Is it the lyrics? Is it the meaning? Is it the instrumentation? For instance, one of the songs I was going to take was Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor. If you look at the original version by Prince, it's an okay song. It's not bad. The Sinead O'Connor version absolutely relies on her performance. So the key thing in that is her performance and the way that that operates. So that's an example of how I want to sort of unpeel songs, get people to listen to them a bit more than just you know, hearing them in the background, trying to really deconstruct songs and find out those little nuggets that make them work. You can take another song like Beach Boys' uh, Good Vibrations, and that is all about structure because it is nowhere near structured like a normal pop song and the arrangement and production, the, uh, the types of sounds that are used in it to create the atmosphere in the song and less about the artist's performance and probably even less about the lyrics. The lyrics probably don't matter that much as does the the way the song is put together, almost like a mini symphony. Are there many U3A members out there in their back bedrooms writing songs, do you think, still? I don't know. I would hope so. I did a, an interview uh, on a podcast back in February with a woman called Saskia Griffiths Moore, a folk artist who I'd actually bumped into. And she had set up an organisation which tries to encourage songwriters who are over 50, so it fitted in quite nicely with the U3A demographic, to get out there and continue songwriting. So entirely non-judgmental, you know, you do what you do and let's encourage people to continue being creative. I think maybe there is a something missing here in the um, things that the youth ray normally does in that we do have a lot of creative writing groups. We do have a lot of poetry groups. I don't think there's a great deal of songwriting groups and maybe that's something that 
should be explored a bit more and taken up and given a bit of a push because I think it's every bit a, a valid creative outlet as is poetry and uh, novel short story writing. Our very own and very talented Lee Wellbrook. Well, that brings us to the end of this month's podcast, our final one before we take our summer break. But don't worry, we'll be back in September with more news and stories from around the U3A and a special report on the U3A Summer Festival. And so, in the words of the 1960s song, see you in September. No, I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. All that remains is for me, Peter Clift, to thank this month's contributors, Bob Wells, Joe Watson, Lee Wellbrook and Nick Bailey. Studio production was by Lee Wellbrook. And to play us out this month, we have Lee Wellbrook playing one of his very own songs, which is called A Place to Leave. Cheerio, and see you in September. I'm never happier than with the road beneath my feet Each passing mile, I throw a smile at everyone I meet I can't be bothered with the burden of a home I can find all the warmth I want wherever I place to leave and a place to be headed for You can keep your four brick walls I head out through the door Four brick walls I head out through the door